I'll say it again. Happy Mother's Day. A shout out to the women who gave us life. We did not choose them, but God chose them for us to give us life. And for better or for worse, they are a huge part of us. Um, has anyone ever been told they look like their mother? Anybody? Has anybody ever been told they sound like their mother? <laughs> Have you ever caught yourself saying or doing something that totally reminds you of your mom? <laughs> and, and in that moment, what is her voice in, in your head saying? And when you hear it, is it received with a sense of nostalgia or complete shock? We are currently in the middle of a series on relationships, and the title given me today for today's message is A Life Worth Imitating. And so, even though today's message applies to all relationships, it is appropriate that we start with this mother-child relationship because truly, all of our learning begins by imitating the person who raised us, whether it was your mom or someone else. We learn through imitating and modeling what we see modeled. For example, when I was little, I thought my mom was the best artist in the world. And so I took to drawing. And given our close relationship, I considered myself a pretty good artist as well. In a very impressionable season of my life, my mom was teaching Sunday school. So when I got older and was given the opportunity, I was like, sign me up. I'll do it. And when my mom became a young woman, she had such a thirst for adventure, and she traveled the world. And when I became a young adult, I packed up my suitcase and did the same. And when I was very young, my mom had just become a Christian, and there were so many days where I would walk downstairs and see her sitting on the couch with the Bible open on her lap, um, spending time studying God's Word and praying. And that changed my life because I started doing that too. But 13 years ago, I became a mom myself. And that's when I really saw her influence uh, kick in even more in, in the littlest ways. Uh, for example, when I was little, she chose to stay home and and take care of my brother and I, and um, so I did that, and my mom would take us outside a lot. She always had us outside, and so I was trying to be intentional to make sure I would spend a lot of time outside with my kids. Another thing my mom did was she would make the healthiest school lunches with no wagon wheel cookie. <laughs> so pretty well every morning as I'm packing a healthy lunch for my kids with no wagon wheel cookie, I think of my mom. And I'm proud of the lunches I pack. And sorry, kids, you don't need wagon wheels. <laughs> Look at how healthy I am. You, you didn't need those. Um, and just the other day, I caught myself using one of my mom's trusty phrases. I had just been lovingly preparing a meal for my family while my children played happily in the next room when I realized that the table wasn't set. And so I called out, Can someone please set the table? I waited, and someone didn't come. <laughs> and there is nothing like a child who won't stop what they're doing three seconds after you decide the table needs to be set and go and set the table. But love is patient. So I waited three more seconds. <laughs> and then I said, <clears throat> delayed obedience is disobedience. Because my mom would say that to me, and wouldn't you know it, wham, it worked. They came into the kitchen, and while I had them there, I thought I would add a little formulation of my own um, for good measure. And I said, you know, you guys, 
It won't take you long to set the table. And as soon as you're done, you can go back to doing whatever you were doing. And I will stay here in the kitchen and keep doing what I'm doing because you know how I love spending time in the kitchen. And um, did I feel a little guilty for making them feel a little guilty? A little. <laughs> but I have learned that guilt sure gets the job done. <laughs> you laugh. In fact, guilt is so effective that in many of my lesser moments, it has been my weapon of choice. Um, such that a few years ago, yes, it's been that long, a few years ago, this image of a squirt gun came to my mind. And I was just like, I use guilt so effortlessly it's always there. It's like, squirt, 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 squirt. And I just randomly haze my family for good measure with guilt. I add a little here and I add a little there. But <laughs> I just sprinkle it around. And I might add that when I am under pressure, <laughs> or my husband's under pressure, or my children are under pressure, it is so much more reactive. And... <laughs> It just, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very, very effective. It's also very easy to refill because I have an endless supply. This is painful to say. I have an endless supply of my own guilt that I just keep refilling with. It's a little too easy. And please do not think that I got this from my mom. <laughs> guilt began with sin in the Garden of Eden, not, incidentally, from our mothers. It was not invented by our moms. But the thing about when you introduce weapons like that into a relationship, when you have something like that in circulation in your relationship, it can and probably will be used against you. I was shocked at my own stealth and marksmanship in, in dispensing guilt. But what shocked me even more was my children's stealth and marksmanship at using, <laughs> at using my own <laughs> tactics. <laughs> Love you. Um, at using my own tactics. To hear them speak to each other the way I've heard myself speak to them that I'm not proud of, or them turn and use those same guilt trips on me. It was painful. So you laugh, but it is very sobering and, and, and was and is very sobering when I realize that so much of what I am teaching them is being caught and not taught. That no matter how good my in-car sermons are while I'm driving them from activity to activity, what they're going to get from me and probably what they'll go on to live out is what they see me doing in my day in and day out uh, life in living with me. And there is such power. All of us have such influence in the lives of the people that are A, either very close to us, or B, people we just spend a lot of time with, our coworkers, our classmates, colleagues. <clears throat> there is power of influence in close relationship, and Jesus knew this. Jesus, when he walked on this earth, he taught multitudes at a time. And as his powerful teachings spread and the word got out, multitudes would even follow him wherever he went. And yet still, he chose 12 individuals to be in close relationship with him, people who he invited to do life with him day in and day out through whom he would have even a greater impact. Um, in Jewish tradition, a child would start memorizing scripture around the age of five or six. This was like a daily event, studying and memorizing scripture, such that by the time they were 12, 
Some of them would have all five of the first books of the Bible completely memorized. Books of the Bible. And then for age 13, 14, 15, they would continue to study, maybe memorize some of the other books of the Bible and also study what some rabbis have said in interpretation of the Bible. But at the same time, they'd be working on their vocation, getting that started. And yet those really keen students, those who wanted to go kind of to graduate studies of scripture and God's teachings, they would apprentice a rabbi, which was the, the word for teacher. And they would ask to follow him and spend extended an extended amount of time with him, not only to learn about his interpretation of scripture, but to see how he practically lived that out in his day-to-day -day life with the goal of becoming like him. And I had read that while you might, uh, some might approach a rabbi and say, look, I really like uh, how you unpack scripture and, and how you're living, can I follow you? But some exceptional rabbis would see the potential in someone else and go up to them and invite them, follow me, follow me. And we don't know the professions of all 12 of Jesus' disciples, but we do know that four of them were fishermen and one of them was a tax collector. And that in these scruffy people, Jesus saw not only the potential for them to be like him, but also to live a life worth imitating for others to imitate. I personally find that very encouraging. Imagine, just imagine being in such close proximity to Jesus day in and day out that you would be so close you could see his eyes light up when a little child peeks around their mother to look at him. Imagine you would be so close to witness the dignity he extended to a leper who was reaching out for healing and he touches the leper in his hand and whole body is cleansed and you saw that. And that you were there to witness his compassion firsthand as a woman caught in adultery was thrown at his feet to be stoned and he extended mercy to her. You would be so close to see the fire in his eyes when he called out the hypocrisy in the religious leaders of the day. And you would be so close that in what seemed like it was the middle of the night, shortly before dawn, you would hear him move and stir and get up and quietly sneak away to a lonely place by himself where he could be alone with God and the impact that that would make on you. And the everyday occurrences of just walking from place to place, walking along the road, chatting about whatever it was that came to mind, I had the privilege of recently being able to go with a group of folk from the meeting place who went to Israel. And I would say the place that impacted me the most was the Sea of Galilee. It's actually a lake and it's not that big. And so much of the miracles and teachings we read about in the Bible happened around that lake. And it was so cool to see the skyline and be like, that was the topography Jesus saw, see the waves lapping against the shore and be like, those were the same waves that lapped against the shore when he pulled up the fishing boat or when he taught the people on that mountainside. And it struck me how close the places were actually together. And, and it might be a day's journey or it might be 15 minutes, but Jesus would walk along the road. And as he walked, he would communicate to his disciples about God's true character and everything he did, he consistently, through his actions, revealed God's true character to them. And one especially profound example of this happened shortly before he went to die on the cross. And he was gathered with his disciples in an upper room to celebrate the Passover. And the whole the place had been set, the meal had begun, and Jesus 
their respected rabbi got up from among them, took off his outer clothing, tied a towel around his waist, and proceeded to wash the dust and dirt and crap, literally, off their feet and take that off of them and onto himself by drying their feet with the towel wrapped around his waist. It's beautiful to read what he said to them after he had done this. Let's read that together. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. For very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. You will be blessed if you do them. I love that part. Living a life imitating Christ is not guaranteed to be easy. It may involve getting other people's dirt on you. But you will be blessed if you imitate him. That same evening, Jesus sums up everything he had taught them and all that he had been modeling for, him, for them by saying this. A new command I give you, love each other. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Everything Christ said and did expressed love, and therefore, Imitating Christ always involves relationship. It can't be lived out as a solo act. The work of salvation is the work of restoring relationship. First between us and our creator, and then between one another. All along, Jesus' plan was to restore relationship between us and our creator by dying on the cross for our sins and rising again. And then it was his plan to tap out and have us take over, embodying him as a group, loving others as he loved, restoring our relationships with each other. And this blows my mind. It is so profound to me that God, who is limitless and all-powerful, chose to enter a human form so that he could give us a concrete example to follow in Christ. And however, as a human, like any human, Jesus could only sustain a limited number of close relationships. In multiplying himself through us, his personal reach to each one of us through each one of us becomes exponential. And it makes sense that he would spread his message about restored relationship through relationship. It was Almost like he deliberately chose to come to earth before Twitter and Snapchat and Instagram and Facebook. He, and yet still, without all of that social media, it could go around the world in a second, but without all of that, his message still went viral, encircling the world, transforming individuals and governments and civilizations to this day. How did it go viral? Through his followers, 
one life at a time through his followers who had been given a very special gift. You see, before Jesus left the earth, he promised his followers that he would send his spirit to teach them and remind them of everything he had said to them. His own spirit to dwell in them and give them the power to live out the example that he had set. And in John 16, verse 7, Jesus says, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When I think about that, this is the best type of cloning ever. Your free will is still intact. Your unique personalities, your giftings, your, your nationality, your language, it's all there. Only now it's permeated by Christ's spirit. You are, in Christ, a debugged version of yourself. Your corrupt operating system has been erased and rebooted by his grace so that you can function as you were always meant to function and have the relationships you were always meant to have. First with God and then with each other. Grace is God's formulation. Dictionary definition of grace is the unmerited favor of God, but it's a whole lot more than that. As exemplified by Christ, grace has unconditional love mixed in. It has forgiveness mixed in. It has mercy mixed in. It has goodwill, undeserved kindness. It's, it's all there, encompassed in Christ's grace. And it is more potent and more life-giving, and more healing. It's divinely sourced. So just as our, our guilt perpetuates broken relationships, our Christ's grace perpetuates healing and wholeness. It detoxifies the brokenness. If we are to be imitators of Christ, we have to be about issuing grace liberally among each other. Starting first with receiving it ourselves, right? We have to receive Christ's grace for ourselves. If you feel like a schmuck, embrace God's grace for you today and then go and issue God's grace to all the other schmucks in your life who you know need it as badly as you do. Guilt has an endless supply in our fallenness. Grace has an endless supply, but it is divinely sourced and bought for us at great expense. So just as guilt is potent, highly reactive and corrosive with an endless supply, Christ showed us a more excellent way it is life-giving. It would be so nice if dispensing grace was as easy as this. <laughs> You're having a hard time in your relationship, like, just a second. You go and you get it. <laughs> You're like, oh, okay, better? Better. All right, let's go. Wouldn't that be awesome? But it's not that easy. <laughs> And yet, it's the, only, it's the only solution. So now let's think about a close relationship that you might be in. Maybe there's some tension or conflict that you keep running into. What would grace look like in that situation? What would dispensing grace look like in that situation if you 
truly want to do what it takes to put the end to that toxicness, this can absorb it. It can absorb it all in Christ. In the Bible, the word grace and its derivatives appear over 200 times. But 144 of those times were used by the Apostle Paul in his letters to the churches. And if anyone knew about grace, it was the Apostle Paul. He was addicted to the stuff because of how it had been shown in his own life. Paul had been a persecutor of Christians. He had been overseeing their deaths. And after encountering the grace of Christ, he became a person who himself was perpetuating the good news of Christ, even at the risk of his own life. In fact, Paul had been so transformed by grace that he could boldly write in one of his letters, it was a letter to the Corinthians, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Wow. I ask myself, could I confidently say to the people in my life, could you confidently say to the people closest to you at home or at the office or in school, <clears throat> guys, imitate me as I imitate Christ. <laughs> Just like I'm living, do this and things will go well. I really want to be able to say that. I want to be able to say that to my children. I want to be able to say that to my husband. I want to model grace in how I speak to them and not just how I speak to them, but how I speak about others when they're not around. But it, I need all of you as well. We need each other because as my children, as Mike and Lily are becoming 11 and 13, I'm very aware that my window of influence is getting increasingly smaller and the influence of their community, their greater community, is getting stronger and stronger. So I ask you, young adults, are you modeling for my children what healthy and God-honoring relationships look like? I ask you, older folk, we need you. Are you modeling for us what it looks like to imitate Christ in this stage of life, how to navigate challenges of your own health or care for an aging parent? And I exhort you, teenagers, the Bible says, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. You may even raise the bar for all of us as to what it looks like to be in unity with one another and um, interact respectfully. God wants to use the next generation to exemplify Christ for us. What I'm saying is, it's all hands on deck. Christ has entrusted to us the work of restored relationship. And one of our most powerful witnesses to Christ is when we extend grace to one another. The more we receive it for ourselves, the more we put it into circulation in our relationships, the more accurately we will together embody the person of Christ. And that is a life worth imitating. Amen. Thank you, Laurel. Thank you. I'm Paul Walker. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and today I'm doing Q&R, which is when we invite people in the audience to text in questions for feedback from you. So we got lots of questions, Laurel. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. Yeah, some here? Some here as well. <laughs> Anybody? So good. Oh, it locks. It goes on automatic. Okay. That's so cool. 
You can tell your friends, if you're visiting today, that I went to a church that has a splash zone. So (laughs) tell them that. So first question. Thanks for your powerful teaching, Lorel. I agree that grace is more potent than guilt. But why do I reach for guilt when grace is available? It is so natural. It is so natural. Um, I do it all the time. Let me just say, like, let me just say that when you agree to speak on a Sunday morning, God makes you live it before you come. And I have shed tears. I can almost, I don't know if it could fill this back. I shed tears over this because this was really painful. I use my children as an example for issuing guilt. But if I were to use the example of my husband, that's a whole other category. And it's painful, and it's raw, and it's hard. It's so easy, and I'm shocked at how easy it is. But the thing is, is applying grace doesn't feel natural because it goes against your sense of justice. But it shouldn't feel natural because it's supernatural. And that's what transects the mess and the muck and the garbage of guilt. That's why we need to be renewed in Christ. We can't do, we don't have the resource in ourselves. We have to, we have to access that and pray for that, to pray for the divine, Christ's divine um, grace to enter our relationship and verbally invite it in. Stop and pray when you realize, okay, this is, this is a mess. I'm locked in this tension. Um, yeah, it is so easy to reach for grace, whoever, guilt, whoever said that I am so with you because I haven't learned it yet and I've spent many hours preparing a sermon on it and I'm shocked at, at how easy it is. But for the grace of God, go we. Thanks for sharing. That's all the time we have today for questions. But let's show uh, Laurel some love. Thank you. You've got questions. I do. Thank Thank you so much, Laurel, for your teach. Uh, There were several comments that people really appreciated what you brought this morning. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, one of our first questions that has come in is, if I've already let guilt out of the can, how can I repair the damage I've done to those relationships? So I told you grace has forgiveness built in. There is such power in humbling yourself and asking forgiveness When you, yeah, we all have guilt. And you can't command someone's forgiveness of you, but you can ask God to forgive you for how you've hurt that person and and go to them and own it and say, will you please forgive me? I want to reset our relationship and I do not know how to begin except to ask your forgiveness. And what's so powerful um, when, if the person is a Christ follower, to just be like, you know what, this is a mess and we can psychoanalyze it till we're blue in the face or could we just pray together and just give God this mess and ask him to reset it and get on with being about um, the people he's called us to be. And I think that's so powerful how Christ gave us that reset in relationship. And um, that's very, very powerful. But if you don't have that reset, then reset before God by confessing your sin and go to that person and at least you press the button and they can choose to respond. But yeah, lavish grace at every opportunity because you want it to be there for you as well when you need it. Yeah. Okay, next question here is, Jesus was the one who initiated the invitation for the disciples to follow him. Should I wait for someone to offer to disciple me or should I seek out a mentor on my own? Okay, so I was searching the internet about how the rabbis found their disciples. And it seemed in one site that some people would zero in on a rabbi whose interpretation of scripture they really appreciated, and they would be like, disciple me. May I live day-to-day life with you and learn from you? And then the rabbi would decide if he'd take him on or not. And then the site was saying that, some rabbis would single other people out, seeing their potential. And we, in the Bible, Jesus had 12 disciples, but we don't know, maybe some of them asked him. Because, and this never occurred to me, 
He didn't go up to maybe all of them and say, follow me, follow me, follow me, follow me. We know he did that for the fishermen. He called Matthew the tax collector. But there was seven other folk that they could have just been studying the word and been like, excuse me, Jesus, I want to be your disciple. Mm -hmm. And that's a cool thought to me. Um, Discipleship is huge because it's how Jesus has chosen to multiply himself. And... um, We really need to keep that on the forefront. So I would say, go up to somebody whose life you see being lived out in such a way that you want to join them and and say, can we do coffee or what can you tell me? And if you can, that can be an ongoing relationship, that's awesome. And we should all be on alert for who we can share our life with, but be bold and approach. Someone has approached me, and I'll call you. <laughs> we, we were getting together regularly, and then life came in and happened. And um, of course, speaking this has challenged me to call her up again and be like, we are so overdue uh, to learn from each other. Beautiful. Okay. My we answers have time are for long, hey? One last That's question. Because they're not written out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, bring it on. Last so this question is just kind of a curiosity, and it's this. I'm wondering if delayed obedience is always disobedience. Ooh, mom, you want to answer that? (laughs) I've never questioned that statement because my mother said it, but I'm thankful that somebody was bold enough to question that. You know, there is a parable in the Bible where someone's like, a father asks his son to come help him, and he's like, no, I'm busy, but then he comes and does it, and then he asks his other son, come do it, and he's like, yeah, dad, I'll be right there, and he doesn't do it. So which one, <laughs> which one obeyed? It's the one who obeyed. Um, delayed obedience is disobedience. It's never too late to obey, right, mom? It's never too late to obey. Uh, we are disobedient until we obey, Right? But as soon as you obey, you have entered in to obedience. And that obedience is the, expre- the way we express love to God is, is through um, obeying him. He says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. My command is this, love one another. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.